All right, Tim, you ready? I'm ready when you are. All right, let's do it. Okay. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Aquirus Podcast. My special guest today is Tim Melvin. He's a 31-year veteran of the financial services industry as a broker, advisor, and a portfolio manager. He's a strict practitioner of asset and cash flow-based value investing in the tradition of Graham, Schloss, and Whitman. He's a prolific writer. He's written for realmoney.com, among other things, and he's also the ghost author of some of your favorite little books. Tim's got a specialization in small bank stocks, and I think financials are particularly undervalued at the moment, so I'm looking forward to chatting to him right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Tim. How are you? I'm great, Toby. Thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. We've known each other for quite a long time. You're 31 years in the industry. How did you start? How did you get into? You started out as a broker? Yeah, well, here's the thing. I, I dropped out of high school. Okay, I took the state standard, you know, the GED exam. So it was in the 80s. Um, a friend of my father's had got me a job at John Hancock Financial Services in Baltimore. And so we're selling, you know, life insurance and variable life. And we had that wonderful new sales system that had just been developed called financial planning. So we were really cutting edge on the, on the financial san- planning sales process. And eventually I moved out to California because uh, that's where my then wife's family was from. And we moved out there, a uh, little town called Merced. And in our little office complex, there was us, there was a fried chicken place, and there was E.F. Hutton. So I spent all my time over in the E.F. Hutton office reading research reports and, you know, tra- driving the brokers nuts because I didn't have a lot of money. So, you know, if I bought stock, I was buying like 12 shares. And this was before discount brokers were on every corner. And I realized I wanted to be a stockbroker. And I, re- I wanted to be a stockbroker bad. I really did. And I had some of the securities licenses. I had a 6 and a 22. So I went to every – brokerage office in the San Joaquin Valley, okay, from Fresno all the way up to Sacramento, and I stopped in every brokerage office. Now, you'd think in a mostly rural area like the San Joaquin Valley, there wouldn't be that many brokerage offices. There were a ton of them. They were (laughs) everywhere. uh, and, And as soon as they heard GED, no college, never mind an MBA, gone, out the door, except for one guy. Uh, the manager of the Dean Witter office in Modesto, California, was a bit of a maverick thinker. So he put me through the aptitude test. I aced it. I crushed it. And they put me through the cold calling test. And they're like, you know, you did better than we expected. And I was like, guys, I, I sold magazines and vacuum cleaners door to door as a kid for five years. Nobody punched me. Nobody sick their dog on me. It wasn't raining on me. I mean, the worst thing that happened is a few folks hung up on me. That's minor league. I, I can put up with that. And so then I took the uh, you know securities knowledge aptitude test, aced it. He wanted to hire me. The powers that be came back and said, this is before the crash of 87, okay? Uh, we only hire MBAs. We didn't hire college graduates. You have to have an MBA to work for our brokerage firm. Well, okay. So you say, damn, there's a dream that I guess I can't have without going back and getting a four year and an MBA. And so maybe we'll do that someday. But I got, you know, babies coming along the way. I was a fairly young guy back then and uh, put it aside. Well, a few weeks after the crash of 87, this guy from Dean Witter Modesto called. He said, OK, all my MBAs have quit except for the guy who's still in the hospital from passing out on the floor the day of the crash. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I need some guys in here that can sell. And so I've convinced them to give you a chance. So I went in, I, you know, I took the series seven, had a, just an outstanding score, one of the highest in the firm for the year of 1988. And I was off and running and it did very well because I had just enough knowledge to be dangerous. <laughs> and sorry, excuse me. That's okay. It's okay. So the idea of making three, 400 phone dials a day just didn't scare me 
at all. Um, so and then as the rest, as they say, was history. I had, you know, I was with Dean Witter. I was with Shearson for a while. <coughs> and uh, I've got to give up the cigarettes. Sorry. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> yeah. And eventually found my home at a firm uh, in the mid-Atlantic region. I'd gone back to Maryland. Very small firm. Really, all we did was municipal bonds and small bank stocks. So, And that's the whole story right there. So, yeah, started as a broker. <coughs> Worked there Apologies. for – That's okay. Worked there for – is that 20 years? And then um, the guys at uh, Real Money wanted me to write for them and the um, – Brokerage firm's lawyer said no. I called them back and I said, I need to make this much. And they were like, when can you start? I'm like, man, eh, tomorrow. I'm your guy. I'm in. <laughs> so where did you become a value guy through there? What what prompted you to become a value investor? My first couple of weeks on the job at Dean Witter out there in Modesto. And remember, they teach you enough in training, just enough to be truly dangerous. Most of the training is focused on the sales process. Okay. So I get back and I'm making my dials. And I'm using tax-free bond funds to you know, talk to people about it. I'm like, this is boring. Let's find something exciting. Let's get a stock idea, something really exciting, get people fired up. So I found one. And Dean Witter had what they used to call the idea of the day. And they research department sent out their best idea that day. So the best idea comes out the day I decided to try my stock experiment. And it's La Petite Academy, right? And in the late 1980s, what a story, right? We were still in the fairly early stages of women back to work and two income households. This was really just gaining momentum. So the need for daily childcare was truly greater than it's. I'm getting excited about this story, just telling it now, <laughs> 30 some years later, right? You know, so that there was just going to be this tremendous earnings growth, and they were located and they were, you know, all over the country and plenty of room to grow. And so I – and I was passionate about it. So I'm calling up people and I'm selling them, opening accounts like crazy, and it's a great story, and they reported earnings. And yeah, they might have missed the number, and maybe somebody touched somebody where they shouldn't have touched that somebody. And yeah, there was lawsuits and legals, and so the stock drops 50%. I'm like, huh, I don't think I know as much as uh, I thought I did. So – there was a guy in the office, and uh, he runs a very large, successful uh, uh, investment management firm today. Back then, he was a broker. It was the cleanest, most efficient way before the plethoration of hedge funds when it was you know, very easy to be an IRA to manage your family and friends' money. So that's what he did. And the guy was racking up phenomenal numbers, incredible. So I literally just pestered this poor guy. I mean every day. How, do, how are you doing it? What do I have to do? How do I learn? And he's – you know. He, like me, a little absent-minded, forgets to get haircuts, documents piled up about yay high on the desk, and he's just down behind him reading and studying. I'm like, look, you got to tell me. I'm not going away. You've got to teach me how you're doing what you're doing you know, because I want to make some money, feed my family, and stay in this business. I don't like selling life insurance. I don't want to go back to it. So he finally took pity on me, and he gave me The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham, of course, and Marty Whitman's The Aggressive Conservative Investor. He says, when you've read both these books, then I'll talk to you. What he didn't realize, I'm a natural-born speed reader. <laughs> okay, Those books were – demolished in a weekend <laughs> and I was back with questions from the books and that's how it started because he really taught me and was an unwilling uh, and reluctant mentor to me uh, for the several years until I returned back uh, to the east coast of Maryland and they just kept building the knowledge base from there and so that's that that's why you're a you're you're still a Graham Schloss Whitman guy and well I I think you really have to add some Henry Kravis in there because, uh, you know, we I really do think a lot more today like a uh, a private equity investor than I think some of the traditional uh, Graham investors because I don't hate leverage, right? I read Dan Rasmussen's study on levered companies and I said, you know, aha, somebody finally put this down in black and white because if a company is reducing its debt load – and that Altman Z score is over about 1.81, and I'm getting the assets or earning stream cheap. I'm not scared. Like I know a lot of guys like Builders, uh, Builders First Source, 
is in the building products business, I have such a favorable long-term view of that business because of the housing shortage. And I think eventually we figure out some of the affordability issues. We start to see a lot more first-time homes being built. I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, but I think it's going to happen over the next five years, which happens to be one of my favorite time frames. Well, the debt to equity, you know, builder's first source is, is well over one. So a lot of the traditional value guys are like, whoa, I'm out. That's that's a levered company. And Ben and Warren said, don't buy those. Um, and, you know, Warren saying, but don't buy companies with debt is hysterical. He runs an insurance company with a huge float. And his favorite investment is banks, the most levered companies on the planet. So I, I've always gotten a kick out of that. He's saying don't buy them so I can buy them. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. But uh, so levered companies don't scare me as long as um, we've got the uh, – the pay down of the debt and the high Z score that's telling me, hey, yeah, they got debt, but they got a lot of cash flow so they can pay the debt. And every dollar they pay of debt makes my equity another dollar more valuable. So it makes sense to me. If they've got the free cash flow generation, then I'll tolerate the debt. And then the other thing is the reason I really started getting interested in REITs and really studying going what's going on here is because I was looking at what Blackstone and KKR – and some of these other firms, particularly Blackstone, though, were doing in the private equity space with real estate. I mean, they're the largest owner of real estate in the world right now, I believe. If not, they're not one, they're two. They're racking up huge returns just buying real estate at cheap prices. And they're, they're not putting anything fancy on it, right? I was listening to Steve Schwartzman uh, at the SHAC conference up in um, uh, New York City earlier this year. And they're like, what's the secret? He says, no secret. It's the same thing that the guys taught me when I first started. You're looking to invest in real estate where you can grow the asset value and grow the free cash flow each and every year. And I'm, I'm like, damn, I think I can quantify that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of your strategies. You have this private equity replication strategy. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, I mean, it's like a cross between what you do and what Dan Rasmussen, who I think you've already interviewed him on I have, here yeah. from the guest. It's kind of somewhere in the middle of, of what you guys are doing. And then we wrap that with real estate. We add the real estate component. We've got the bank component. I call that the lending component. Be business development companies would go in there if they were attractive, right? Then you've got special situations, which again, tracking private equities lead, primarily infrastructure, although we do have a few holding companies in there like Steel Partners that own a mix of different companies or many private equity companies in and of themselves. And we own a lot of infrastructure and private equity is really into infrastructure right now because once you put it in place, be it a solar farm, an airport, whatever it is, right, the cost or the annual cost of maintenance are not that high and the 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 Cash flowing in the door is massive. It's uh, Bruce Flat of Brookfield Asset Management calls it being a toll collector. So we're just collecting tolls in that section of the portfolio. But if you put all this together in an individual portfolio, all of a sudden you don't look like a mutual fund. You look like Colbert, Kravis, and Roberts. And our work shows that your mutual funds don't do all that great. And KKR, oh, they've done pretty good. <laughs> you know, that's top quartile private equity funds consistently – over that 20% line, that's what we want to replicate. And I have to say, I'm pleased and impressed with the results that we've had so far. So what, what, why do you think that the private equity firms have sort of directed themselves to these? Why are they so good at sniffing out these areas? Well, I, I think it evolves, right? You're borrowing a lot of money. So you, you figure out how to be a pretty good lender. You begin to understand the value of permanent cash flow. So you start looking for vehicles that can provide that permanent cash flow. The rents on, let's say, a uh, solar field, field of solar panels, okay, that rent's coming in every year. There's no variation like there might be in the operating accounts of one of your companies. So you spend the money once, you've got a forever stream of free cash flow coming back. So I really think it, it evolved from their core buyout strategy. And then the real estate, you know, I think uh, Schwartzman at Blackstone just had an aha moment. He's like, I own all these businesses all over the world and I'm paying everybody rent. Why in the hell am I doing that? I've got all this cash, all these investors. Let's just go buy the building. We'll pay ourselves rent and then buy some more buildings and collect their rent. And other guys followed. And But when you put it all together, they're, they're kind of not correlated, but they're all very high returns. Um, the same things that drive REITs have nothing to do with the buyout part of the portfolio, which, by the way, is based 
really heavily on your work in quantitative value and deep value. And one of the first discussions you and I ever had was which was more important, that enterprise multiple or the price to book value. And we arrived at the conclusion that this for non-financials, your, your metric, enterprise value, much more effective and important. For financials, this price to book value, probably much more important. And I still view the world today based on that, what, seven, eight year ago conversation. Yeah, as do I. And that's, that's exactly how I run my portfolio. I use the, for the industrials, I use the, I, I, you know, my acquirers multiple and for the financials, I like price to book value. And that's, that's what my portfolio looks like now. Okay. And it, yeah, my, mine as well. And, you know, we do, um, still doing the newsletter business. And so we're putting out a bunch of articles and we run model portfolios and that's exactly how we run it. And we try to stay, I call them buckets. We try to stay in those four buckets right now, not doing a lot in the lending bucket, particularly the BDC side of that, not finding a lot in the buyout bucket. I mean, that's very slim pickings right now. As you know, there's not too many bargain basement enterprise multiples. But we are finding some some special situation infrastructure, holding companies in particular, and the real estate investment trusts are just – right now, they're the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, really love chatting to you, as we've done over the years, about uh, small bank stocks. So just uh, what what attracts you to that uh, that area right now? Well, it's the same thing that always attracts me to them. Banks have been in a consolidation phase since the interstate banking law started to change under Ronald Reagan. We had about 18,000 banks back then. We're down to a little under 6,000 financial institutions if I throw the thrifts in there. And they're very small, the ones I favor anyway. Nobody on Wall Street cares about them or really can buy them. There's like this small little handful of activist funds that are active in this space, but nobody else is. And if you want to see – some of the more active traders and investors out there, you want to see their eyes glaze over, start talking to them about buying small bank stocks below book value. You can put a room to sleep quicker than anything else. But here's what happens. You get a small, well-run bank, and it's trading below book value because, again, nobody really cares about it. Good things are going to happen, especially if you've paid a lot of attention to do they have enough capital? What does the loan book look like? If you get all three parts of that right, the loan book, the capital structure, and the price to book, Toby, it's hard to lose money. It, it may not happen overnight, but it's very difficult to lose money. And sooner or later, odds are, somebody's going to come along and buy that bank. Well, let's, let's talk about a few of those things. How small are you talking about when you say small banks? <laughs> Uh, I think the average market cap in my portfolio is probably around 50 million. On the same token, I did suggest that we all try to buy shares of a $10 million bank in Hawaii the other day. So we'll go small. That's one of our biggest edges. We'll go small, put a limit order in. I've been in situations where it took three, four months to get filled on the stock, and that's fine. If I get filled, I'm odds are I'm going to make money. And so let's talk about uh, the banks themselves. So when you say uh, well capitalized, what, what are you what are you looking for there? We, we want an equity to assets ratio over ten. Um, before the credit crisis, the av average ratio in the country was probably down around seven. And back when Peter Lynch was executing a very similar strategy in the 70s, he thought the equity to asset ratio should be above five. Banks were much more levered machines back then. The leverage is down, and we're comfortable with that. Excess capital allows for acquisitions, it allows for buybacks, and it allows for dividends. And I'm a huge fan of all three of those things. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to ask you a little you, – you keep going. I was going to ask you about the valuation, but let's keep on going. Um. It also, when you have excess capital, if you go back to 2007 and you run some screens, and you, okay, which banks in 2007 had equity to asset ratios over 10? Well, those banks that show up on that list, they're all still with us. Right. Not so many of those below 10 are still with us. So I want to be able to survive the shock, if right. you were. So that's, a, that's spoken like a true deep value investor. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the metric that you, you talked about then that uh, 
it's getting a lot of bad press lately. And even though I think that that's really the only metric that you can use for financials is price to book value. So talk us through how you value one of these stocks. It's just, it's price to tangible book value. We only use tangible book value, by the way. Um, I don't really care about the intangibles in banks. They don't amortize the same way they might in a tech company. So I, you know, Add up the loans, subtract out the deposits, divide by the number of shares. What do we got left? That's what I want to pay for the bank. Now, Richard Lashley at PL Capital runs a uh, cost takeout model of what it might be worth in a takeout. And I think it's pretty cool and I play around with it. But my core metric is price to tangible book. And let me just digress for one second here. I know price to book value has become a very unpopular metric. And the key saying is it doesn't work. Here's the truth. It still works in financials and it works very well. It also works on smaller stocks. We run models. We run them once a week. We back test them rigorously. One of the best performing models over the last year is a very small cap, 100 million and under, trading below book value with a strong balance sheet. Now, if I'm running a $5 billion fund, I can't do anything with that. I can't buy any of those companies. Unfortunately, I'm not running $5 billion. So I can pile into those things and still do real well. The problem with price to book value is not that it doesn't work. It's that it doesn't scale. So in your, in your, the, the takeout metric that you just discussed there before, is, do you view that as sort of an upper end of the valuation? Um, at midpoint, really, uh, because, for instance, we had a bank taken over last week at a um, 70% premium from what we paid a few years ago. It was ridiculous. When I ran it through the takeout model, it showed maybe a 20% upside. Clearly, that was understated. Relying on price to book value, I think I was able to capture more of the extreme move than I would have if I'd relied heavily on that cost to takeout model. And so what's, what's interesting right now? Do you have some a name that you can give us? Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Ah, Glen Burnie Bank Corp in Glen Burnie, Maryland, my old hometown. This is a relatively small bank, but it's trading at about 87% of book value, plenty of capital on hand, great dividend, 3.74%. It's just a small bank located between Anne Arundel County and Baltimore, which is a, a fantastic market, believe it or not. Uh, the economy doesn't start going downhill to you actually cross that Baltimore city line. So it's in a great market. They have exposure to the DC market, uh, could be a very attractive target if somebody wanted to take it out. And same token, the bank's like a hundred years old. It's been there for a long time. They've survived several crises. New management came in a few years ago and has done a fantastic job, cleaned out all the bad loans. So you just got this clean, pretty dividend paying bank in a great market that I think no matter what happens to the stock market and the economy, over time, that bank does very well. How, how big is that bank? Glen Burnie Bank Corp is a whopping $28 million market cap. So, if, if you, folks, if you take any of my recommendations, limit orders are mandatory. Using a market order will ruin your whole day. <laughs> and so, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the dividend there. Is that that's, uh, something that you look for in in bank stocks, you're looking for high yielding bank stocks. Not in in this particular strategy. Um, most of our banks are very small. I would say less than half of them actually pay a dividend. But as long as you bought it up, we have been working with some new stuff and running tests. That's one of the things that you taught me is always be testing your ideas. And we found that if you combine price to earnings ratio with dividend yield, you end up with monstrous returns just by buying the 20 highest yielding banks with a low PE ratio. And that tested clean all the way back through the credit crisis, all the way back to 1999. Yeah, you got hit in the credit crisis. I mean, no way you owned a portfolio of banks and didn't, didn't see some pain, but it recovered very quickly and none of the banks went out of business. So, uh, where do you see the market for value generally? Are you are you you're wholly focused on bank stocks? Or are you looking outside? I look outside banks as well. Now, my say, if I'm going to go second favorite area, real estate investment trusts. This is the most under-owned asset on the planet by individual investors. And I love it when you talk to the brokerage firms. They're like, "Well, we're going to add a five percent allocation." To real estate investment trusts. Well, seriously, because since they changed the tax laws in 1972, if you had just bought 
equity real estate investment trusts. You've outperformed the S&P 500 by a very considerable percentage. You've collected fat dividends along the way, and you've been backed not by hopes and dreams of some technology company, but by you know actual real estate. Um, so most individuals should have a much higher allocation, in my opinion, to real estate investment trusts than they do at this, at this or any other time. And what's the aversion to real estate investment trusts? I don't know why the street has always had such an aversion to real estate investment trusts. I guess – you know, maybe they're not exciting enough. They're not sexy enough. You know, everybody wants the next Amazon or the next Facebook. And what they forget is whoever the next Amazon and Facebook is, it's very hard to identify them looking forward. Um, I'm old enough to remember that in 2002, Amazon was on the Barron's death watch list <laughs> uh, because they were burning cash at such a rapid rate. And if Amazon was such a sure thing and everybody knew it was going to happen, where are all the Amazon billionaires? <laughs> because I, there should be you know a bunch of them. I don't know any. Um, well, there's one. So oh, there's, there's two now. We definitely, but I don't know him <laughs> or her. Um, whoever they are, they're going to pay rent. The ones that don't make it, going to pay rent. So everything good in science and technology and business, it happens inside. Most of them pay rent. So I'll just collect rent checks. Talk to us a little bit about business development companies. What is it and what, what's attractive about it? Well, business development companies are uh, investment for trusts, basically, that make loans to middle market companies. And these tend to be very higher yielding loans. And it's an area, frankly, that the banks stepped away from post credit crisis. They're like, whoop, that's riskier lending, a lot of LBO lending, mezzanine financing. And here's the things. I do love them. I think they're wonderful, especially those associated with the large private equity firms. There's Blackstone's got one, Apollo's got one, uh, I think TPG's got one. Right now, they're not a buy. On paper, they look good. They're paying these fat double digit yields. But there's too many people in this business. There's over one trillion in the leveraged loan market right now, and an awful lot of it's been lent by people that are new to the game. Uh, last year, I was at the leveraged lending credit crisis in a private credit crisis conference. I'm sorry, in Chicago, and as I looked around the room, a lot of guys there under 30. These guys had never seen a bad credit market, and we're seeing covenants, the restrictions on the loans themselves. Uh, you know, pretty much non-existent at this point. We're seeing credits that should be an 8, 9, 10, 11% credit doing, you know, loans at 5, 5.5, and, and then the funds themselves are levering that up 3 to 1. There's a lot of danger in the levered loan market right now. So I would step back away from the business development companies, but they're going to go boom, okay? I don't know when. Don't have that kind of crystal ball. They're going to go boom. When you Those, say boom, they're going to go up or they're going to go down? Which, which oh, they're going to go, talking? They're, they're going to go down. Eventually, if we get into a recession or rates start to go up, you know, it's it's there's just so much dumb money lent at unattractive rates with no covenants right now that we're going to have to have a meltdown in these things. The ones that survive the boom are going to be life-changing investments. And I expect they'll be those with the closest and tightest relationships with the private equity firms. The reason for that's simple. If you look, KKR's got one, and I know Apollo's got one. We'll, we'll go with Apollo. Those guys came from Drexel Burnham, then went into the private equity business, borrowing tons of money to buy companies. I think they know a little bit something about who they should and should not loan to because they've had to pay back loans for you know better than three decades now, and they structured a lot of those deals at Drexel Burnham that did blow up. So they know what a blow up looks like too. They've got more credit experience than anybody else in the market besides possibly the bankers. So those BDCs, they'll see their prices get absolutely trashed, but if they survive, they've got that relationship, you're going to be able to get into something that's going to look like junk bonds back in the 90s with 15 to 20% yields and massive upside. So I'm just kind of sitting here twiddling my thumbs waiting for it. I wish it would happen tomorrow. I've got some cash I'd love to put to work there, but we'll wait because it will happen. So you got a list and you're just you're just waiting patiently for the for the business development companies to get yeah. cheap. 
just waiting for the default rates to come up. Uh, and, it'll, you know, it'll be a problem. It'll cause some messi messiness in the stock market. It's not anything like, I mean, there's a trillion dollars, big number, nowhere like the hundreds of trillions in the banking system that we put at risk back in 2008. So the market won't like it. It'll cause a hiccup, but, you know, nothing that's terribly value destructive from a broader perspective but a lot of these things are going to go by the wayside or get acquired by stronger competitors and from that point forward these things will be a layup much like junk bonds were in 1990 uh a lot of the positions we've been discussing so far are going to be smaller and they're likely quite a liquid you said it would take several months in some cases or in one case to, mm -hmm. to buy them um but you've got some research on uh illiquid stocks yeah, I, actually, Robert uh, Roger Ibbotson of Yale did this, and it's uh, quite shocking and, and fascinating when he got into it because he divides the world into liquidity and um, valuation. So you had large liquid growth, you had small illiquid growth, large liquid value, and small illiquid value. Now, think about this for a second because in most people's portfolio, what do they have? That large liquid growth stock. And this study went all the way back into the 70s, by the way, and was updated, I think, at the end of 2014. Now, down here, you've got your small illiquid value. These, you know, they're small banks, they're companies nobody's ever heard of. The big firms can't buy them. You would think all the money's got to be up here in this large liquid growth because that's what everybody tells us is the good spot. No, <laughs> you've got a return of like 2% annualized over this 30-year period in Ibbotson's study, down here, the small illiquid value stocks have returned on average 18% a year. So illiquid, I, so what? I don't care. You know, most people will say, you know, Warren Buffett says that if you can't, you know, stand the stock market closing tomorrow for five years, you shouldn't invest. And you'll hear that repeated all the time. None of them really mean it <laughs> because they, you know, they prize liquidity. I don't really care. I have no intention when I buy a stock, unless something goes horribly wrong in the financials, I'm not selling it for an extended period of time. I'm going to hold that till it's at a premium valuation. So liquidity is not that big a concern for me. Again, I am unfortunately not running billions and billions of dollars at this point. I always think there's good logical reasons for uh, liquidity being a pretty good indicator of something good that's going to happen. It's, and it's because when these stocks get beaten up, the people who own them know that they're selling it way below value. And the only reason they're selling at that point is because they're forced to, because they need some cash somewhere else in their, in their portfolio. So it's all tightly held when it's really deeply undervalued. Yeah, the small stuff does tend to be tightly held. You find a lot of family-run businesses at, down there. And, and a lot of those, your exit is going to be because the family decided to sell or the kids don't want anything to do with this company that dad and granddad started. They want to go out and do something else with their lives. So dad and granddad look around and say, well, we need to sell this, but you know, we're going to do it rational. We're not going to sell it at this, you know, 70% of this of book value valuation. We're going to hire a banker and it's going to get sold at a proper price, which could be two and even three times book value. We've seen that happen more times than I can count. Uh, talk to me about your insider strategies. Okay, now these we really do a lot of work on because it's that's so intuitively makes sense, right? You know, if an insider is buying a company, then something good should happen. After all, they're in the best condition to know. So here's a couple that we found. This first one, I'm going to admit, I, I ripped this one off from the guys at Whale Wisdom. They did an article on it. I ran my own test, and I'm like, hey, this works. The toughest area of the market for value-oriented investors like us is biotech. And it, right, it's intellectually frustrating because we know biotech really is changing the world. Uh, biotech is going to make us live longer, live better, but they never trade at valuations that can attract us. So this strategy is real simple. We're going to go in. We're going to follow the biotech insiders. When they buy more than $100,000 worth of stock, C-suite executives, we're simply going to buy that stock right there and sell it in 30 days. The numbers are shocking how high – I mean they're – shocking is the only word I have. I'm not, I'm not even going to quote them because they're just mind-blowing. And so that's a little more trading-oriented, but it works. It's worked for over 10 years now, and it does give you a clue as to which of these little clinical bio, uh, biotech stocks might be about to make a move. 
Which makes sense. So insiders have some view on the way that the stock's going to trade post some announcement and they try to just front run it. Sure. And if you wrote a six figure check, you know, unless you unless you are Mr. Bezos and bought your own stock, you've got a you've got some conviction behind that. You're not too worried about what's going to happen at the FDA trials and that type of thing. And then the next strategy is really just again, hundred thousand dollar check. Okay, open market purchase, no options, no stock awards purchase by any C-suite executive. And on this one, we're just going to hold it till we find a better idea. Put 10% of your portfolio into each new idea. If a new one comes up and you're fully invested, you sell the bottom performer, right? So we just hang, hang on to them till we find a bottom better idea. So some of these stocks can be in the portfolio quite some time. Again, you easily climb what I call the 20% hurdle using that strategy. A annualized returns in back testing and rolling back tests are north of 20%. And we've been doing it recently and it's working. I mean, we started implementing it real time with real money and you're seeing almost immediate returns from these stacks. And so that, that, how, is that, how is that different from the first one you mentioned there? Oh, that's right. There is a difference in that one. I forgot. They're 20% below the 200-day moving average. Knew I was forgetting something. So yeah, this is a beaten up stock that nobody wants. And of course, the th thing on Wall Street is, you know, 200 day moving average matters. Never buy anything below the 200 day moving average. If there is a consensus on Wall Street that says never do something, I am immediately going to start testing what happens if I do that. And that works very well. So you're looking for something that it's below its 200-day moving average, at least 20% below. At least, yeah, it's it's quite a bit below. This is a this is a really beaten up stock. It's kind of the ultimate contrarian strategy, really. And the and the uh, somebody in the C-suite has written a big check, hundred thousand dollar plus right. check, in order to yes. buy it. And it has to be C-suite. It can't just be any officer or director. It has to be a C-suite officer. So CEO, CFO, COO. Right. Got it. Uh, Talk to us about the Graham two-factor model. Well, you covered that one in quantitative value, and that's Graham had that real simple model that he started working on in the 70s, and he would back-tested it for 50 years, and it did right around 15% a year. You and uh, Wes back-tested it for quantitative value. It was doing around 17% a year. Well, I back-tested it back to when you published the book, and it's still doing right around 15% a year. And these are god-awful boring companies, right? There's nothing exciting about any of the stocks in this portfolio. It's just dividend-paying stocks at less than 12 times earnings, if I recall, was the cutoff that was used. And you just rebalance that once a year. It's kind of a set it and forget it investment strategy. You buy these stocks, you walk away. If something goes up 50%, you sell it. Otherwise, you sell it in two years. I mean, that's ridiculously simple. My recollection of that one is that we might have struggled to find enough stocks in the universe that we were looking, but we might have been looking in a bigger universe. I think it might have, it might have, it might have been concentrated in a handful of stocks at any given time. You're, it does not produce a lot of names. And again, I'm going to pull the screen up right now. Um, it doesn't, but you should be able to get a 25 to 30 uh, stock portfolio. Let's see what we got here. I've got this one set for 20 stocks. If I remove the restriction, and here's it's a shared guarantee. It's an American national insurance company. They sell annuities. I mean, could there be a more boring business? These aren't even variable annuities. They're fixed annuities. Um, Dillard's, just all kinds of just very boring companies. Well, I insurance like assured companies. guarantee. What's that? I like assured guarantee. I, it's, that's, that's a great company. I remember when Wilbur Ross was buying that after the credit crisis, and uh, it was so ugly back then with all the potential losses. And, of course, now everybody's worried about their exposure to Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. But that seems to be working itself out. Okay, now if I remove my restrictions and rerun this. Yeah, we've actually got about 50 names that would fit that Graham screen today, which is pretty good given that we're 10 years into a bull market. And there's and, no market cap cutoff. In your in that screen, right? There's no. Minimum, there's no what? There's no minimum market capitalization there. No, no. Um, what's the smallest capital? The smallest one in here is about five hundred and forty-five million, and they go all the way up to, uh, well, billions. Some of the really large companies. That's if big you enough. Look, 
Yeah, so MetLife's in there, uh, Lincoln National. Those are all huge multi-billion-dollar companies. So they tend to be larger cap, dividend-paying stocks, and it's a sleep real good and do better than average portfolio. It's um, so yeah. Ever since you back tested it and updated it in the book, I've kept it pretty much updated every year. So uh, it's a great strategy. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it. It's just that I I was under the impression that they weren't around a great deal, but I haven't really looked at it that closely over the recent yeah. period. There seems to be more than enough, although you are going to be very industry concentrated. I'm looking at it right now, and I see a lot of insurance companies. I see some uh, some energy companies. And so if you're trying to diversify across um, sectors or industries, that's going to be a little tricky. You're going to be very industry concentrated. I think that, you know, that's – that's not something that necessarily bothers me. I, I, I like industry concentration because I think that that's how you outperform, but I, I, that, that's a double-edged sword yeah. too. Can be, yes. Um. Uh, so w- one other strategy that you, you, that you follow that I particularly love is the liquidation value strategy. There's a little uh, – one of the things that I've noticed too is that they're, they're not they're – a little. I always say they're a little bit like cicadas. They come around every – seven years or so in quantity um, but you, you have some tweaks that you make to the liquidation value that helps you out well yeah well first thing in the liquidation value we i do it more like peter Kundal than ben graham we assign a little bit of asset value to the stuff that the company owns not a lot but a little bit because some of the stuff like um uh real estate obviously can be converted to relatively quickly so can a lot of the machinery i mean my son works as a uh, cnc machine uh seller and reseller there's a really robust liquid market for that stuff so we just kind of try to figure out what that stuff is worth and then the most important thing a always avoid the biotechs because the cash burn in those things is phenomenal just because it looks like it's trading for less than liquidation value it's probably not actually doing that and then we just run the simple credit checks, Altman Z score and Piotrowski F score, and only buy those with the highest scores. That's this is a killer strategy. It's it's more trading oriented, right? You're going to rebalance that about every 13 weeks. So if you bought something at 70 percent of liquidation value and it's gone up to liquidation value, you're going to go ahead and sell that. It's uh, a little bit like Marty Whitman. He has a great quote where he says. Uh... He, he he likes to include real estate as well, and he'll say a first class office building is much more liquid than, depending on the inventory, but it could be fashion or something like that. That's not going to be able to sell easily. Right. I'm, yeah. I mean, I don't think you want to put a whole lot of weight on you know inventory, particularly if it's a, a dressmaker. Right. The reason this company's trading cheap is because nobody likes their dresses. So I don't think I want to value that inventory very highly. It was one of the. Uh, Joseph A. Bank was a stock I followed for a long time because it was trading at a discount to net current asset value, but that net current asset value had an enormous chunk of their yeah. suit inventory in it. And uh, John Hampton, who's the Australian guy who's known for he's doing known, known for shorting, he had he had a he gave a presentation at a value investing congress, and his observation was um, often in many in many frauds, I'm not saying that Joseph A. Bank was a fraud, but often an indicia of fraud is that they have a very large asset sitting on their balance sheet that outs- it's outsized relative to everything else. And it, that's an accrual from the mm-hmm. way that the double entry bookkeeping accounting requires you to grow an asset if, you're, if there's a difference between your reported income and your cash flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we try to avoid companies with larger accruals because he's right they tend to uh be little time bombs in the making so uh if i see that in something that appears to be trading below liquidation value i'm going to lose interest pretty quick we're just look we're looking for that little handful right there's only 10 right now in a bad market there'll be hundreds but just those little tiny companies that are worth more dead than alive but they have the financial strength to survive and again can i put my whole portfolio in these no there's usually not enough that 2009, there were enough. You could have done it then. Um, but it's just it's going to add incremental return because there's only a few of them. You can't manage a billion dollars. It doesn't scale. But for individual investors, you can put some kick to your returns using that strategy. 
the uh, the argument the other way on Joseph A. Banks was that when guys go to buy suits, they must have the suit that they want immediately. They won't wait around for it to be made. So it was sensible for them to carry an enormous amount of inventory. And apparently suit styles don't change very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of that. I hate waiting for a suit and having it tailored and all that. But st- inventory in a retailer... That's it's always going to be a fire sale. I don't care if it is something that's going to sell. Everybody in the room knows that these guys are bankrupt and the creditors want the cash and they want it today. So nobody's paying anything close to even cost. So you're always if you overvalue inventory in a liquidation situation, uh, I learned this the very, very hard way back in the 90s, going to lose money. So I don't do, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> what, what was uh, what was Graham's recommendation for the haircut that you should give to liquidation value? Do you remember? Was it twenty? You should seventy five percent, two a third. A th- yeah, he wanted to buy it at two thirds of uh, net current of the net current asset value. So I'm not I'm not quite that strict. I'm just looking for a discount large enough to provide me with a big return. I mean, if I buy it at eighty percent and it goes you know, trades at a hundred, that's a 25% gain. And it's usually going to take me less than a year to get that gain. So again, it's an incremental strategy. I love it because it's just ridiculously intellectually satisfying. Um, But I said, it does add a very nice kick to your overall returns. Uh, So options and value. Talk to me about how you use options uh, in a value investment context. You and I had a long talk about this, if you recall, a few months ago. We didn't record it though. No, we didn't. And it was um, – I was kind of uncomfortable putting this out in the newsletter format, where, which is where I live and breathe these days because uh, I'm too lazy to get a job. Um, and we kind you kind of talked me through that. And the biggest way to do it – I've always done this. I don't know why I was reluctant to send this out to subscribers and readers. But if VIX – if the VIX, the volatility index is high, it just makes sense to sell cash secured puts on an undervalued company. Now you think about it, you've got a $12 stock that you love. It's trading it, you know, with an enterprise value to EBIT multiple of seven, or maybe it's trading at a discount to tangible book value and the credit's good. So you're looking at this and the stock's okay, 11, 12 bucks. Why not sell that 10 put and collect four, five, 6% for a month or two? It's as close as you're going to get as a win-win on Wall Street. If it goes down, you're going to buy it at the 10 bucks minus the premium. Okay, so you've bought this stock that you like at a lower price than it's currently trading for. If it doesn't go down, you get to keep the premium and do it again and again and again. What's the risk? Well, that the stock takes off or gets taken over and runs up, but you still at least collected some premium along the way. The other risk with all put selling strategies, and this is where the individual investor tends to have one of their mental breakdowns. If I put up all the cash and do this, I've got 6%. If I put up half the cash, well, now it's 12%. If I just put up the exchange minimum margin, it's a 30% two-month return. This is the best thing ever until that stock moves against you and you've used all the cash in your account and done too many and you can't meet the call and buy the stock, that's how you go from having money to not having money. (laughs) So if if you do this strategy, it's fantastic. But if you're doing a thousand shares of a $10 stock, put up the entire 10 grand, okay? Take the smaller incremental return. Don't get crazy about it. And then the other thing, and this is is something I'm going to give you full credit for this because I've never really used it until recently, and that's buying in-the-money long-term options on stocks that you like a whole lot. It's really only going to work with larger cap stocks, but it can give you four, five, six times leverage over the next year on a stock that you have a high conviction is going to go up. I use it too, particularly when I think that the I like the I think the stock's very undervalued, but I'm not super confident about it. Could be a zero. Like if there's a risk of a zero, then I like the leaps on those things because I'm I know how much money I can lose. This is where we're buying a call, uh, and I, 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 I buy them at the money because I think that if you if you think that they're undervalued, I hate to be right and have bought them out of the money and have it not hit the strike and be oh, caught that's, and miss that's out for the worst. that reason. So I buy them that's, at the money. Okay. Um, And one other strategy that my son-in-law and I have been doing a lot of work on, we're both big fans of Nassim Taleb, the black swan. Okay. So we're looking and and we actually did this and it's the perfect kind of, kind of way to describe it. I think Tesla is a zero. 
And if we evaluated Tesla as a junk bond, it's it's a C rated bond at best. Elon Musk is the he's the PT Barnum of the modern age, and he's gotten taxpayers and investors to pay for all his very cool to toys, which in my mind makes him very very smart. But I don't want to own his stock because you know Fiat Chrysler's coming, Ford's coming, Mercedes is coming. You know he's not going to have the driverless car market for very much longer uh, as the dominant player. He could go to zero. So I looked at it 2021 back in February when the stock was over 300, and I saw that you could do a 150, 125 put spread for, you know, like two bucks because the premiums were just enormous. So I'm buying almost two full years. I'm only paying a couple bucks, and I'm betting that something bad is going to happen at Tesla in two years. I think that's a fantastic bet. So we made it. Of course, the stock went all the way back down a little bit under 200. The option spread blew out to, yeah, it was like four or five times what, what was paid for it. It's come back a little bit now. I have no intention of closing that position until 2021. And then on the long side, I look at Fiat Chrysler. And here you've got, you know, Manish Prabhupada telling us they're going to make eight, nine bucks in 2021 uh, a share. The stock's 14. Why not buy a 2021 $20 call for a dollar and just sit back and wait and see what happens? So lower probability events with enormous payoffs if they happen. And by selecting very undervalued good companies like Fiat Chrysler and really overvalued kind of dumb companies like Tesla as your targets, I think you can inch – the probability is a little bit further up the scale in your favor. Wouldn't do it with my entire net worth. Uh, it's better than going to the racetrack. My wife, wife doesn't get quite as angry as she does when I go to the track. So, uh, And just as much fun. It's, again, intellectually very stimulating and exciting. And, again, I think you can add a little bit of incremental return doing that. So let's, let's – I, I agree completely about all of those stocks that you just mentioned there. So t tell us a little bit about your – what's the newsletter business? What, what are you doing there? Well, primary site to find out more and to kind of keep track of what we're doing is going to be at maxwealth.com, and that will serve as a gateway to any further that you may wish to go down the road. Obviously, we have paid products. That one happens to be free. And we have three or four articles a week. You know, what am I thinking about? I do throw out, you know, the occasional, well, the frequent stock idea that are in larger cap companies and things that might not make it into our more focused portfolios, but still use those core value and private equity replication principles. So it's a good place to start if you want to find out more, and it doesn't cost you a nickel, and that's just maxwealth.com. And you're on Twitter as well, Tim. What's your what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's real, real fancy, Tim Melvin. <laughs> Well, <laughs> just at at Tim Melvin, <laughs> and I think you've got Snoopy on his house as your. I, I have Snoopy on his house. My dad was a Snoopy addict. He always had a Snoopy T-shirt on underneath his business suit, and he passed that down to me. So I mean, if we, we, we pull back, there's a Snoopy sitting up here. There's a Snoopy in an Orioles uniform over here on the bookcase. Uh, so yeah, I inherited the love of Snoopy. So he's my Twitter avatar. And you're an <laughs> Orioles guy. I am an Orioles fan, and it's um, it's fascinating. We're going to find out if Moneyball actually works, or the Houston Astros were a fluke. Okay, uh, we've got the same guys that did the Astros rebuild. It's almost comical to watch this baseball team in action. It's like you you shouldn't you shouldn't be able to be this consistently bad. But it's the first year of a rebuild. It's kind of fun to watch, and I've been loyal to this team since I was six years old, um, which is you know longer than many nations around the world have been in existence. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to abandon them now. <laughs> well, Tim, that's that's time for us. Thank you very much for joining us today, Tim Melvin. Toby, thanks so much for having me on. I look forward to the next time. My pleasure.